Just one minute, please. I'll be right back. So the topics for today are at the intersection of legal and social theory. And they move in the direction of an argument about structure, the idea of structure, which has been recurrent here in our conversation, and the different ways of representing structure and their implications for legal thought. Now, the first theme is where we should locate the problem in the rationality or coherence of the dominant practice of legal analysis. The practice that I've sometimes called here the retrospective and rational reconstruction of law. The reconstruction of law in the language of impersonal policy and principle. And to understand the problem, best is to go back to the five-step argument, and in particular, to the last step in the argument, the fifth step, and its relation to the fourth step. The problem seems to be located in the absence of a reliable convergence between the prospective genealogy of law and the retrospective genealogy of law. The prospective genealogy of law is the birth of law, the creation of law out of conflict, out of conflict of interests and out of conflict of visions or ideologies. Law as it arises in real time in history from conflict, including conflict that is expressed in the, in the legislative politics from which law arose if there is a legislature. The retrospective genealogy of law is the representation of law after the fact by the jurist, according to this method, in the language of impersonal policy and principle. Now, what's the problem? The problem is that the agents who struggled over the content of law at the prospective moment believed that they were, in fact, divergent in their visions and in their interests. They didn't think of themselves as the instruments, as the vehicles 
of an emerging cohesive view. How can it be then that after the fact, in the hands of the jurists, law can be represented as if it were a gradual, fallible, but nevertheless persistent approximation to a rational scheme of policy and principle? That's a simple way of putting one's finger on the nub of the problem. Now, comments or questions about that. Do you see that? Do you see where the, where the issue is? Actually, one of you, I think it was you, who early on in the course brought, brought this up as a difficulty. And that does seem to me to be a central difficulty. What do you think? What are the ways of, of, of managing the difficulty? So one way would be to say, the policies and principles are only partly embodied in the law. They're suggested, they're prefigured, but they must be significantly there because otherwise the jurist would be making it all up. And making it all up is what they're not supposed to do under the rule of law and under democracy. On the other hand, if too much of the scheme is supposed to be there, if the claim is that the scheme is already there, then that seems to aggravate the incompatibility with the reality or the experience of conflict in the prospective genealogy. And of course, our suspicion that it, the scheme can't really be very much there is aggravated by the plurality of suggested vocabularies. So in any real legal culture like the American legal culture today, there are different schools of legal theory. There's a law and economics school that proposes the vocabulary of allocational efficiency. There's a liberal school of rights that proposes a vocabulary of impersonal rights. And there was a legal process school that tries to provide, to develop the discourse out of the idea that each agent in the legal process has distinct roles, responsibilities, and methods by which to fulfill those responsibilities. So the very plurality of those vocabularies makes it seem that the scheme couldn't be significantly there, because otherwise, how could all these people disagree about the appropriate vocabulary? So what do you think? Yes? So I, you know, I think you're struck by something you said about the, like, the, otherwise the jurist is not, uh, uh, oh, sorry, otherwise the jurist is going to be seen as making it all up, because that's what to do. Yes. But I wonder if within that, there's a kind of, there's a more subtle distinction between um, like the ontological status of there being a conflict or a plurality, uh -huh. uh, maybe that's not recognized by plurality, et cetera. Um, and on the other hand, the epistemic uh, kind of significance of, of the retrospective jurors making things known. So the difference there being, simply put, um, the prospective jurist um, is, uh, I'm sorry, the retrospective jurist is making things known, not making things up. And they well, that's what he would like to say, that's right? What he'd like to yes, say. so, but on what assumptions about history is yeah. that plausible, right? Exactly. That was the question yeah, you asked right. way, right. way back, right? Yeah. So the assumption must be somehow that these agents in politics, the classes, the workers, the segments of the labor force and their leaders must not adequately grasp what unites them. The assumptions that their seemingly opposing ideologies in fact share. And on that way of managing the problem, what the jurists are doing is retrospectively to make explicit the common ground. Well, is that plausible? Because, because 
the thing about these policies and principles that play a central role in rationalizing the human analysis is that they're not like the abstractions in which philosophers, like liberal philosophers, trade. They have to be very detailed. And they have to do with, deal with the substance of the law. And the more concrete they are, the less plausible this idea of the common basis seems to be. Right? Or am I missing something in this suspicion? It's a brief reply. I, I wonder if um, something at issue here is the assumption, even within that framework, of the prospective and respective jurist having the same goals in the moments of situation. The prospective agent or politician. Oh, agent, sorry, agent. Because yeah, prospective yeah, is yeah, not yeah. a jurist. Yeah, sure, sure. The jurist comes on the scene in this picture that I'm drawing, the simplified of course, picture. Of course after the battle has ended, yeah. uh, and he says, he announces to the contestants right. in the struggle over the content of law, the secret meaning of the laws. He says, this is what you have done. You, don't, you, didn't, ex you didn't think you were doing this. You didn't expect to do this, but here it is. Uh, I wonder if it matters whether or not the agents involved on the ground, so to speak, think they're doing something or not, because ultimately their goal is in the situation is to cope with what's before them, not try to rationalize it or you know, write about it as this impossible jurisdiction. Yeah, so, but, but just to, to, to accentuate where the tension lies. Sure. You know, uh, so the completely disenchanted view of law would be that there's a struggle and the struggle always ends at a particular place, which from the standpoint of any one random rational scheme is likely to be a random place, right? It's a truce line. A certain faction prevailed here, prevailed 70%, another faction prevailed 30%, and there's a truce line. Now, in the medieval battles, the heralds came onto the field after the battle so that the battle wouldn't have to continue. And they said, such and such a side won. They announced who won. And rather than there have to be a, rather than the defeated, not accepting their defeat and going on with the struggle. And on that view then, law would be simply these shifting and arbitrary truce lines between the different factions in their achievements and failures, in their victories and defeats. That picture is precisely the picture that is then repudiated by the rational reconstruction of law in the language of impersonal policy and principle. It wants to say that over time, little by little, the law is working itself pure, and an inchoate scheme is being decanted, purified, and made explicit. And that's the basis for the language of policy and principle. Because, as I said, the vocabulary of policy and principle can't just be abstract like a political philosophy because it must cling to the details of the law, the tension is aggravated between the prospective genealogy and the retrospective genealogy. Some other suggestion about how to, how to manage this conflict? And then, of course, the other side of this argument is if you accept this, if you accept that the contestants in the political struggle over the content of law were unbeknownst to themselves at the service of a scheme which was unfolding in history. There's trouble. There's trouble for the idea of democracy. There's even trouble for the rule of law. They didn't know what they were doing, but this is what they did.
That is, now of course, there are many ways in which this can be finessed. The, the most important way is by saying, it's there, but it's not completely there, and so forth. But how much there? It must be significantly there. So if it's not there enough, then they're all making it up. If it's there too much, then you're claiming that history has the secret rationality, which the contestants didn't recognize. And then whatever quotient of improvement the jurists add can be then justified in the name of this idea that it is part of the proper role of the jurist to put the best face on the law, to see it not as the representative, as the instrument of lobbies, of interest groups, but as an approximation to the interests of society or the impersonal interest. That's a simple account of the core of the problem in the theory of uh, rationalizing legal analysis, which is, as I say, this hegemonic view being disseminated through the world as the, the wave of the future, the providential sequel to the doctrinal formalism of the 19th century. Now, second theme, let's advance and relate this to categories that are invoked in that essay, The Universal History of Legal Thought. The suggestion is that this co contrast and this divergence between the prospective genealogy of law, the birth of law out of conflict, practical and visionary conflict, and its retrospective genealogy, its representation after the fact in the language of impersonal policy and principle, is an instance of a persistent theme in the world history of legal thought. And the theme has to do with the conf conflicted, contested relation between the law of the jurists, legal dogmatics, as it's called in many legal traditions, and the law that is made by those who hold power in the state. So the problem of the law of the jurists, of course, takes on a special form when there is judge-made law, and then judge-made law can be contrasted to statutory law. But the basic conception is one thing is the law that the jurists imagine and expound in their doctrinal categories, and the other thing is the law that emerges out of this battle of visions and interests in the real world. The first thing, the first kind of law is the law that's called legal doctrine or legal dogmatics. And I mentioned in an earlier class this concept of legal dogmatics, which never really had a significant presence in the Anglo-American world but is the way in which jurists around the world most often think about law. So what is legal dogmatics? It is a form of discourse so unlike our contemporary forms of discourse that it's hard for someone in the 21st century to understand what it is. It has very unique characteristics. And I suggested in that earlier class that one of the ways to appreciate the special character of these characteristics is to pursue comparisons, analogies, with other doctrinal or dogmatic disciplines. And especially, for example, theology, 
theology by contrast to the sociology of religion or the anthropology of religion. So what are the special features of a dogmatic discipline? The first is that the discipline is constitutive of its subject matter. The discipline is not simply about a subject matter that is different from it. The discipline helps make that what it is. So the practitioner of legal dogmatics must see himself as a participant in the imagination, in the imaginative construction of law. The moves he makes in his discipline, his method, are moves internal to the making of law. On the other hand, the subject matter, there's a bridge, there's a continuum from the discourse to the content, to the subject matter. But the subject matter itself is broken up because dogmatics is part of a world of symbolic forms. There is always a surface, like the rules, the doctrinal categories. And this surface of the symbols is supposed to be understood in the light of underlying understandings, of interests and of ideals. And the understandings are not supposed to be the way that I just described the role of the heralds after the battle in a medieval battle. It's not supposed to be just a report about who won and who lost, or how much one faction won, or how much another faction lost. A third characteristic of the dogmatic method is that there is no clear cut or absolute distinction between explanation and prescription. The claim, there's always an open field. Not to say that it's the same, that in the dogmatic discipline, there's a confusion between an idea of what the law should be and what it is. But the understanding of the direction in which the law should be elaborated is, for legal dogmatics, a legitimate and indispensable influence on our understanding of what the law is. And that idea is captured in the contemporary rhetoric about it being part of the responsibility of the professional interpreter of law to put the best face on it, insofar as possible, for example, not to see it as simply an advantage that a, a lobby or an interest group extracted in the in the moment of conflict and confusion, but to understand it as a good faith approximation to a defensible solution for society. And the fourth characteristic of the dogmatic method is that it always involves a pretense of claim on coercive power. It may be the coercive power of a church against the heretic, the apostate. If we take the analogy of grammar as a dogmatic discipline, the community of speakers who speak correctly as opposed to the outsider. But in law in particular, the pretense in the ultimate in instance of, the, of laying a claim on the coercive power of the state. 
So all the contemporary social sciences and the social theories about structure and its transformation arose way after the dogmatic discipline. The dogmatic discipline is ancient, universal, and from a past so distant that it's hard for us contemporaries to understand what it is. This rational reconstruction of law in the language of impersonal policy and principle seems to be a version of legal dogmatics, even though it doesn't understand itself in that way. Now, the second element in the universal history of law is law created by those who hold power, especially power in the state. Because with the birth of the state comes the potential for the creation of law made by the state as opposed to just customary law. Law as the will of the sovereign. So we could reformulate the problem of the convergence or divergence between the prospective genealogy of law and the retrospective genealogy of law as a problem about the relation between law, the law of the jurists represented in legal dogmatics and the law of the power holder those who hold power in the state. But this comparison, this substitution of one vocabulary by another, immediately has a positive implication. It adds something to our understanding of the problem. And it shows us, ultimately, that something is missing from this account a third element of the situation of law. The power holder, whether he be an autocratic sovereign or a democratic sovereign, intervenes in a reality which is, to a significant extent, just there. So if we're to take this idea of law as the will of the sovereign at face value on its own account of itself. All of the law must be created by the sovereign. But of course, that's not realistic. That's not what really happens in society. All the state-made law, the legislation, the law that arises from the will of the power holders is like a series of episodic, localized interventions in social life. That's more like what it really is. If we go back to the Middle Ages in Europe, we can see even that there was a vocabulary that described the situation as it is. The law of the jurist was a jus commune, a common law, which they developed in the categories of doctrine. The law of the prince was an episodic, localized adjustment of this common law to the realities of the situation, to special problems, to special challenges, to changes of circumstance that the jus commune could not resolve. And there were two different words used to describe these two kinds of lawmaking. Uh, and the application of this kind of law. There was the jurisdictio, which was <clears throat> 
the development and application of this common law by the jurists, and there was the gubernaculum, which was this episodic revision of particular pieces of social practice in the law, which the prince intervened to change something in that background of the use comune. Now I ask you, what about law now in the contemporary state? Is it the creation of the whole structure of society? Or is it more like this series of episodic interventions in a structure that's already there? It seems to be that rather than what it claims to be. Now, of course, there's a rhetorical maneuver, which is the following. You know that, for example, when St. Thomas More was arrested and thrown in prison for his refusal to accept the Anglican faith and to break with Rome, he said to his judges and persecutors, when I was practicing law, uh, I understood and respected the maxim, qui tacet consentire videtur. If you silence, you're presumed to consent. So if you applied that maxim to this situation that I described of the structure of society and legislation, you could say, well, the sovereign must be consenting to all of the parts of structure that he doesn't change. Uh, and that would be the way of affirming or justifying the pretense that it is the will of the sovereign, even though on the surface it doesn't seem to be the will of the sovereign. So of course, uh, St. Thomas More didn't get away with his claim. His judges didn't take his argument seriously, and he was executed. Uh, but this allusion then suggests the presence of a third element in the situation. Alongside the law of the jurists represented in legal doctrine, in legal dogmatics, and the law that is the will of the prince, of the autocratic prince or the democratic prince, of the sovereign, there's a third thing, which is law as the brute, unjustified, and largely unexplained structure of society. Given that the other things, the law as doctrine, and the law as the will of the sovereign in the real world exist by coming to terms with this real structure, which they never more than partly transform. Now, is that not so? So there's, there's a conception of the, of the problem or of another problem. How do you exclude or, or assess what these visions aren't mutually exclusive, right? Like, it, you can have, take a combinatorial view where it's a little of all of this. And well, so, you, so you say, yeah, but then you would say, that, yes, is, there is this third element in law. Are you saying there is or I there would, isn't? I would say there's probably four elements. There, it, it, so in addition to the three you've laid out, like there's this doctrine. The, the so the doctrine is the, the first. Law of the right. Jurist, yeah. right? Then there's the law of the, the will of the sovereign. Then there's like this structural reality or reality. Yeah. And then I think there's I would continue to keep like the agents engaged in political process. In but isn't that the second thing? I mean, because. <clears throat> 
the idea, the concept of the sovereign is agnostic. It's neutral. It's so, meant to so include the, the democratic sovereign, too. Yeah. No. It's not just an image of an autocrat. That's one extreme of the spectrum. I, isn't there's some disconnect between the interest groups, the, the political factions fighting the battle, and the output, right? Like the it, like if law as species of command is a Palestinian sense, like I don't think that that. Well, because that's also an artificial view of law. That's kind of simple-minded, right? right. There's, a, there's a command and in a, in a pyramid-like form. Yeah. But it's, it's, I'm not, not saying that, right? I'm, right. No, I'm taking this realistic view and saying uh, the command, because uh, they're, they're methodologically, the view of law as the law of the sovereign has had two wings. One wing has been analytical jurisprudence. And it starts with a simple-minded command idea that there are commands, that the commands are in some hierarchical order. It's the pyramid and so forth. The other is what you could call the fighting theory of law which was associated in the history of modern legal thought with people like Rudolf Yering and Oliver Wendell Holmes, and later on with Carl Schmitt, which is that law comes from conflict. Uh, but they're both versions of the same idea. Law is the will, whether the will that has dominated and, and organized everything in this system or the will in clash, in clash. Yeah, I guess what I'm pushing on is that even if we if we take Schmidt's understanding, like it, I would imagine there is a disconnect, and indeed in, in I'll make the argument that there is a disconnect between what, for example, Congress passes and gets signed by the president, and what the people are struggling. Of course, the people and are struggling what, over their what, real, real problems, real right. interests, and so forth. And what, and even the meaning of that law to those groups in common. Mm -hmm. When you say the meaning, what do you mean by that? You mean the practical significance, or do you mean how the people see the law? What? Probably a combination of both. Uh -huh. And it's like. How I interpret, right? Like, if I'm engaged in political, uh, political struggle and I'm pushing for a law and, and something closer, approximate to my vision of what the law should be, is enacted, I consider myself victorious. But maybe my conce my conception of that law is is different than probably what's written, and is also different than the jurists interpret. Sure. And so it's meaning to me, it may be symbolic, right? This is a, a, a victory that my faction has achieved, and it's meaningful in terms of how I imagine the future of the society in which I would have. Yes, but at the end of the day, one of these views is going to have to prevail, in fact, right? Yes. Well, or I temporarily. Uh -huh. Like the individual's interpretation and understanding of law need not reconcile with law mm -hmm. as it is. Yes, but because law is ultimately coercive, right. there will have to be an outcome, mm -hmm. and the outcome will have to shape and limit, constrain, right? Uh, that's part of the whole spirit of this but will even, theory of law. If I reject interpretation. And maybe I'm not an agent with Howard's or... The yes, exactly. Well, now, we, but if I reject the interpretation... Yes, you may reject it intimately, but then are, are you like the citizens in the Roman Empire that Hegel said sung in their chains, right? So... Yeah.
uh, there's still change. Uh, and, and that's seen what the laws are, but this will theory of the law is ultimately about. Uh, you may pretend that they're not there, you may sing your sorrows away, but you'll still be chained. So you see why there's this third element that, that arises in the, in the history of law? The, the structure is supposed to be just something that we chose, but in real history, we don't choose it. We just intervene in it partially or in some fragmentary form. So that the real practice of society is some combination of this inherited real structure with a series of changes that the sovereign wants or decided on or that the jurists imagine. But both the representation of law in the vocabulary of the jurists and the remaking of law by the will of the prince press against a background that already exists. The background is not empty. It's not a vacuum. Yes? I was just thinking about um, high exterior law as being generated by humans but not deliberately designed. So how does the, your real structure... But not, but not what? Not deliberately designed or designed or chosen? Yeah, that's a somewhat different idea because if you take the core context of that idea was the context of the theory and ideology of market fundamentalism. That if there is, and it's very important in its practical and economic significance, it's a somewhat different idea. It's that if you have spontaneous coordination without the intervention of a sovereign, so there's no one on top deciding in the end what has to prevail. And one of the forms of this spontaneous coordination is exchange, market exchange. Hayek's thesis, simply put, is that spontaneous coordination has an inherent structure. And that's my critical and facetious remark that if Robinson Crusoe traded long enough on his island, he would eventually reproduce the whole system of German private law. That's the, that's the meaning. That's, and although it seems like a joke, I think it's what pr most of the practical economists actually believe, as they think a market is a market, property is property, contract is contract. So this background of conventional ideas in, generated in legal history through this interaction between the three things I just mentioned, the law of the jurist, the episodic interventions and the structure by the prince, and then the real structure. To, to what extent, like, do we take the economist's argument in that sense as, like, as, I mean, we obviously don't take this credible, right? Like, I think if you look at the doctrine of... Well, I'm not taking it as credible no, because no, I'm no. making fun of it. But, yeah, but, right. but it is, but, but it could be presented in a way that would make it look, cre make it look credible, do, I think, unjustly. Do, but do people trained in, like, do you think it's common in people trained in the law to believe that, like, contract is contract and it's this pure concept yeah. that wasn't I think it it is, because if you, so let's pause for a moment now in response to your, the question you bring, and discuss for a moment the attitude of economics, the economics created by the marginalists of the 19th century to institutions, and especially to the institutions of the market. And I think you could say that broadly there are three types of economics with respect to institutions, 
that arise from the marginalist turn at the end of the 19th century. The first kind is pure economics, which has no institutional implications and makes no institutional assumptions. And the Austrian economists, one of the wings of marginalism, correctly understood there wasn't really a causal science at all. It was a species of logic. Uh, that draws inferences from the picture of uh, maximizing choice under conditions of constraint and scarcity. And I think this profound insight of the Austrian economist explains something which is mysterious about this economics. You know the economists revere mathematics. They think it's a big deal. They insist on mathematical formulation of their models. But there's a problem. The mathematics that they use is almost exclusively toy mathematics. No mathematics is really used in economics that was invented after the middle of the 19th century. So it's not like the mathematics of physics. And now, why is that? It's not that they're not clever enough to use some higher form of mathematics. It's that a ma the only kind of mathematics that, that is useful to them is a mathematics that can represent deductive reasoning, deductive inference. And so they have this picture of this quasi-logical picture, which is not causal, and therefore can't be falsified, right? So the way the economist proceeds in this tradition is by multiplying models. If the model doesn't work, you just come up with another model. You, you, you change the values of the parameters. But in the substitution of models, the underlying picture is never put under stress because the underlying picture is not controversial. It's an idealized picture, which is not meant to be a description of anything. So the economist is like the... The economist is like the joke by Groucho Marx. I have principles, and if you don't like them, I have other ones. So you, <laughs> you, you, you have a model, you replace the model. It doesn't work, you have another one. And this allows for this, this allows for this other strange feature of this economics, which is that this combination in which there's a lot of theoretical in reality, logical analysis. And there's a lot of empiricism, but they have very little to do with each other. There's, there's no inner dialectic between the empirical and the formal. Now then, there's a second type of economics with respect to the issue of institution. It is the fundamentalist economics, which we were just discussing, as in Hayek, this idea that spontaneous coordination among traders has built into it a whole institutional structure. So the market economy, the market order does have, is a specific content, and it's a specific content which you can make explicit and contrast with control, state control. That's fundamentalist economics. Now there's a third kind of it economics with respect to institutions, which is, you could call it equivocating economics. And it's illustrated by the argumentative and analytical practice of the American macroeconomists, uh, who depoliticize Keynes's theory and made Keynes acceptable in the United States. Uh, so just an aside, so Keynesianism was a kind of incomplete apostasy from marginalism, uh, uh, which didn't really develop its potential fully And the Americans then, American 
microcosm, people like Samuelson. Uh, found a way to prevent it from being represented as a challenge to the dominant theoretical paradigm. The, what they did was they took the received marginalist economics and they labeled it microeconomics. And then the reduced version of Keynes's theory as a theory of the deployment of countercyclical fiscal and monetary policy by the state. And they label that macroeconomics. So now when you open an economics textbook in the United States, what was supposed to be a contest between two ways of thinking about the economy, two theoretical paradigms, turn out to be the titles of two chapters in the same book. So it's been reduced, right? So then, so then this is illustrated by the practice of these macroeconomics of pretending that there are law-like relations among large-scale economic aggregates, like the level of saving, employment, and inflation. Huh? For example, so-called Phillips curve, that there's a relation between the amount of inflation, the amount of unemployment, has a law-like character. Then someone comes and says, this law that you claim to exist only holds so long as you keep constant a whole host of background institutional assumptions. For example, are the workers unionized? How are they unionized? What are their powers via vis-a-vis -vis capital? Who controls monetary policy and so forth? If you change any part of those background institutional arrangements, these supposed law-like regularities will vanish. And indeed, the Phillips curve is now thought not to apply, even though 40 years ago it did apply. So what happens is that if the actual circumstance of the society is one of relative institutional stagnation, then this, con this rhetorical concession of saying, yes, it does depend on that, but I can go back to my former analytical and argumentative practice, because in my country, these institutional arrangements are not the object of an active conflict, and therefore, it will be stable, confusion of stability with lawfulness. So that's a third kind of economics. So it's just an elaborate answer to your question about the role of laws in this economics, uh, which is very interesting because it shows, it shows the, the place of the institutional imagination. How, do, how does a fundamentalist economist, like, like if they actually, let's just say in the United States context, right, like read the transformations of contract in the 19th century, yeah. throughout the entire century, right, in property, like, They'd see it as a detail. They'd see it as not changing the fundamental. And there is, there's a fact about private law which reinforces this, because in the 20th century, the main tendency of legal history was the creation of a new body of public law, the law of the regulatory and redistributive state, which, and this new public law was then superimposed on a relatively untransformed body of private law. So if you look at contract law, you see that contract law conceptually continues to be organized around the model of the bilateral executory promise. Even though the, the arm's length fully articulated bargain among strangers for and a change of performances at some instantaneous future moment, which execution then exhausts the contract. That's the dominant model. Even though that reality, that idea of contract, is in fact an exception to what most contractual situations are like. A much more important and common form of contract is the relational contract, 
an ongoing contractual relation for a series of performances not fully bargained out, not fully articulated, in which the main object of the contract is the future of the relation itself. And the performances are just material to build the relation. And so the, the contract, the idea of contract is that other idea. Even though the actual contract, and then there's a penumbra, a periphery of exceptions, such as the relational contract. Same thing in property. So the unified absolute property right of the 19th century is the basic paradigm. Even though the reality of property is the reality of the dismemberment of the unified property right into a series of fragmentary forms of property. Claims on productive resources. And for example, financial markets, contemporary financial markets are entirely based on this disaggregation of the property right and the creation of markets and derivatives of the unified property right. So I think that these details of legal history help explain why this notion that despite all, a market is a market, contract is contract, property is property, is still plausible to these people. On the other hand, I qualify that statement by saying that I used to think that their main problem was ideology, and I've come to think that their main problem is ignorance. As my, as my little story just now illustrates. <laughs> Now, any other remarks about this? All right, so now we come to this third theme, which is uh, the theme of the two vocations of law, which we started to discuss in, in our earlier conversations. So there's the lesser vocation of the professional interpretation and application of law in an adjudicative or quasi-adjudicative setting, which is most of the stuff on the jury. So, and you can't really understand this rationalizing legal analysis, this principiology in the vocabulary of policy and principle unless you grasp the situation that the theorist imagines. He imagines himself as whispering into the ears of the judge. So the methodological posture of legal theory is to stand alongside the judge, this omnipotent, clear-sighted judge, and give him advice about how to put the best face on the law. And we've, I've had this discussion with you. We've had an argument about all the costs of this way of thinking. Huh? It seems to me that there's a mystification of law. Law is not really not like that. It's not this organized set of principles and policies in each field in this pyramid, ascending pyramid-like structure. The mystification of law, in turn, provides an occasion for the usurpation of power by the jurists, uh, by the professional interpreters of law. The usurpation of power is excused or justified by as a kind of noble lie, a platonic lie, right? You put the best face on the law. That will be mo most useful to the people who are most likely to have lost out in politics, because then the law won't be just the iron fist of the triumphant factions and interest groups. And the third and most important harm that it does is that it occupies the space of, an alter of a transformational alternative because the space is occupied by this 
rhetorical apparatus. But that immediately raises the question, which many of you have brought up, of what the alternative method in this lesser setting, I insist, this lesser responsibility of professional interpretation as it is, what it should be, by contrast to rationalizing legal analysis. And a place to begin is, the, is, is to imagine what are the elements of a realistic deflationary view of legal analysis in the performance of this lesser work. So I think that the first element is to say, let's distinguish the purposive or teleological element in interpretation from the idealizing and systematizing ambition. We will want a form of a, a hermeneutic approach, a, 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 an attitude to interpretation that is purposive, that is we, we will recognize that the meaning, the, the practical meaning of the laws depends on the attribution of purpose. Explicit or implicit, purpose can often be judged implicit when it's more or less obvious, or when there's some shared context in which all of the participants have the same understanding of the purpose. But we won't think that these episodes of legal reasoning are steps, moves in the direction of the formation of an idealized system. So this is, in essence, what the rationalizing legal analysis did. There was this social democratic settlement after the Second World War with very detailed characteristics. It was subsequently hollowed out or eviscerated under neoliberal attack. And what resulted was what we could call the flexibilized, relatively emptied out form of social democracy, which sometimes labeled social liberalism. That's the hegemonic position. And what this rationalizing legal analysis today does is it tries to give a patina of uh, authority and legitimacy to this historical operation as social democracy, like everything else in the world, is more or less accidental. Then there's this attack. It's hollowed out. It comes out in this diminished form. And now we're going to pretend that this diminished form is some system of policies and principles. That's the basic message of the uh, rationalizing legal analysis. So let's get rid of that, and let's open practical legal analysis to analogical reasoning, which is, after all, always the predominant element in the work of practical jurists, going back and forth between the clarification of purpose and the classification of recurrent fact situations. But Let's abandon the idea that it's going to be a system. Now, that will bring us closer to what the classical common lawyers in the 17th and 18th century wanted and how they thought of themselves, and closer to the methodological practice of the classical Roman jurists and jurisconsults in the late Republican period, because their view the view of the common lawyers and the view of the Roman jurists is that a form of legal discourse transfixed by conceptual abstractions was not better, it was worse. It was, on the one side, a genuflection to bureaucratic domination, to autocracy, and on the other, on the other side, a failure to understand the specific character of jurisprudence that has that's a form of prudential reasoning, circumstantial reasoning, 
which resists reduction to abstractions. They viewed it as an art. And you learn to be proficient in this art by attending to the affairs of the Republic in different offices. So we have this then, this view that is purposive, but not idealizing or systematizing, and gives its proper role to analogy, to analogical reasoning. This view, and this is why I'm calling it deflationary, is bounded on the bottom and on the top. On the bottom, it's bounded by equity, by equitable adjustment. And on the top, it's bounded by judicial statecraft. When I say bottom or top, I mean the lower courts or the upper courts, the constitutional court, the state, the highest tribunals. So at the bottom is equity. Now, what is equity? Equity is when the result that seems to be required by the law deviates sharply from the expectations of fairness in the relations among people in the situation. So that the formal result that seems to be commanded by the law seems starkly unfair. So what is, equity occurs when the judge departs from the formal result in the interest of adapting it to the expectations and standards of fairness prevailing in the circumstance, because he can do that without threatening the structure. So this problem arose uh, in many countries, and certainly in the United States, in the evolution of the doctrine of economic duress. So duress was a way of dealing with inequitable or unconscionable situations, saying this is illegitimate because it was done under duress. But if one were to say that all classes, that all contracts made in a class society among members of different classes are vitiated in principle by duress, then it would be impossible because equity would then, as it were, be hijacked, would be kidnapped by a, by a campaign against the class system. So that's not what equity can be. The judge can do equity when he can adjust the outcome without threatening the structure. That would be a summary definition of it. So that's the deflationary practice at its lower bound. And what about the deflationary practice at its higher bound? That's when The judges, for example, in one of these contemporary states with different branches, find that the political parts or the political branches of government are stalemated. There's some urgent problem in the society which the president or the prime minister or the Congress, the parliament, are un unable to resolve. So the judge then, under the practice of judicial statecraft, raises the sword and cuts the Gordian knot. And this cutting of the Gordian knot is always an appeal to civil society. As, help me, says the judge, or says the higher court to society. I'm making a bet, the judge says, that you want this. Now show that you want it. Support me. Uh, so the presupposition of the practice of judicial statecraft is some partnership between the judge cutting the Gordian knot and a social or political movement in society. So I think that this picture that I've just drawn of purposive but not idealizing or systematizing legal reasoning bounded on the bottom by equity and bounded at the top by judicial statecraft is much more realistic as an account of what it's really like than this stuff about the principles and the policies and the rationalizing patina. So it's, a, it, it's less a proposal to reorient the practice 
than it is at, in the first instance of redescription of the practice. And, but a, a claim that it should assume its own mission. That is the mission that it already practices without knowing it, without being able to describe it. It should be able to describe and to defend against the principiology. No, 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 because of course we, so we would think we would think that if the judge begins to be a kind of substitutionism, we would call it in the history of leftist theory, that he substitutes for the people or for the vanguard, this is a distortion. But in the proposal that I just made of how we should approach this, there is what I think is a lesser and more acceptable form of substitutionism, in which the judiciary presents itself as the ally or the partner of a movement in civil society. So he's not acting alone. Now, of course, when he makes this decision to cut the Gordian knot, he doesn't really know for sure whether he is alone or not. And that's the sense in which it's a bet. It's saying, I'm betting that I'm not alone, that you want this. Uh, and so speak up, uh, show that I'm not alone. So you could say, when these constitutional decisions, uh, like Brown, were successful in the United States, it was because they had a partner in the civil rights movement, for example, or in its representatives in the Democratic Party. That's when they work. They, they don't work, and they don't have a stable future, when that partnership is not clear. That's the view. And now notice, I don't think this is the main mission of legal thought. This is, but I, I think this is a real mission. Legal thought in the adjudicative setting. What I think is a perversion is when the picture of the judge deciding cases assisted by his theoretical ass assistant, the jurist, the rationalizing jurist, then becomes a totalistic view of the mission of legal thought, because then the most important work is being cast aside. So I think the first thing is the question is whether this is clear or not. I mean, and then we should discuss the merits of this view as a view of the lesser vocation of legal thought. But the first thing is where, whether you understand it and see it on its own terms for what it is. What do you think? I'll give you a minute because I have to go someplace. I'll be right back. 
anyone want to make a statement about these, these ideas, about how we should approach the lesser vocation? Otherwise, I'd go on to the next theme, the last of the themes I wanted to address today, which is to introduce the description of the theme of structure. Uh, the unexplained and justified structure, which I suggested is the third element in the universal history of law. And in the next two weeks before the spring recess, I'd like to discuss the problem of the agent of this transformation and the jurist as an agent, uh, and the method by which we are to reimagine the structure intellectually, part by part. But what I want to do now is address the problem of the understanding, the imagination of the structure. Because that's the first problem. The first problem is that we now have no usable, credible, reliable way of talking about structure structural discontinuity and structural change. So first let me give a rough a view of what I mean by structure. Because what I mean by structure is basically equivalent to what in the history of political thought was called regimes. Aristotle has a theory of regimes. Montesquieu had a theory of regimes. The theory of regimes and of regime change is the essential axis in the development of political thought. In social theory, the highest explanatory ambition is the ambition to uh, elucidate, to understand the structure and structural change, the change of regimes. And in practical politics, the highest ambition is always to uphold the structure or to change it. So we have this problem, which I'm going to present in simplified and stark terms to make clear what I think is the basic issue. In classical European social theory, especially in Marx, the consummate expression of classical European social theory, we had an understanding of structure. And this understanding was organized around a revolutionary insight, which Marx made clear in his critique of the English political economists. He said, the English political economists treat as universal and eternal laws of the economy what are in fact only the laws of a particular economic order, the order that you call capitalism. And what is this revolutionary insight at the center of, the, of classical social theory? I'll explain it metaphorically. So, this the structures, the structures are the institutional arrangements and the ideological assumptions associated with those arrangements that shape the surface conflicts of social life, especially the conflicts around the way in which we mobilize the resources of political power, economic capital, and cultural authority to create the future within the present. That conflict about the creation of the future within the present is shaped by the regimes in their institutional aspect and their ideological aspect. So you can imagine that history is like a game of musical chairs. There's the music, the music is the conflict, the conflict of visions, the conflict of interest. And from time to time, the music stops, and the players in the game sit down on the chairs, 
the chairs of the structures. So when the conflict is temporarily or partially interrupted, the structures arise. They are the frozen form of conflict. And they are us. These structures are, they're, the, they're frozen politics. They're congealed humanity. They arise only because conflict stopped temporarily or was contained partially. And of course, it's never completely contained and never completely stops and will go on. Now, this insight then was that the structures are our invention. We made them. We invented them in the course of our conflict with one another over the terms of our access to one another. And because we made them, as Vico suggested already at the end of the 18th century, we can understand them. We can understand them from within because they are our own creation. We can understand them in a way in which we cannot hope to understand the furniture of the universe, the phenomena of nature. Understand them in the way in which the creator understands his creation. But this insight into the artifactual character of the regimes was corrupted or compromised in classical social theory. And most clearly in Marxism, the most influential theory for the left, for the progressives, by a series of restrictive assumptions, of determinisms, which we could call the illusions of false necessity. So the first is there's a limited menu of regimes in the world. Marx called them the modes of production. Feudalism, capitalism, socialism. Before feudalism, the slave system. And so every regime is the enactment of one of these permanent options. That's the first illusion of false necessity, that there's this restricted menu of options. The second illusion is that each of these regimes is an indivisible system. So if it's going to change, it has to change all at once, all of it. You either manage a system or you replace it. The third assumption is the historical laws assumption. There are laws in history governing the foreordained succession of these regimes in historical time. And there are laws for each of them as well. So the economists were not mistaken to search for laws. They were mistaken to assume that the laws that they identified were eternal, were universal laws of all regimes, when in fact they were just the temporary laws of one regime. So the, the implication of the combination of the first illusion with the third, the restricted menu illusion and the historical laws illusion, is that we don't have to have a project because History has a project for us. And in fact, we're going to get in trouble if we pretend that by some kind of voluntarism, we can invent or create a project. The second illusion, the indivisibility illusion, that the regimes are indivisible systems, has a practical implication of immense importance which is the binary view of politics. All politics is either the reformist management of a system 
or it is the revolutionary substitution of one system by another. The problem with this binary idea of politics is that it is false to what structural change is really like in the world. Structural change, when it happens, is almost invariably piecemeal, fragmentary. It can become cumulative under a certain conception. And becoming curative, it can even be revolutionary, seen as revolutionary at the end. That's the only kind of structural change that it, there is. So the idea of revolution, a, a totalistic substitution, in practice becomes an alibi for its opposite. So take today in the world. Many people who run countries around the world are disillusioned, fatalistic social democrats. And the way they think is this. They think in the Marxist terms. Real change would be the substitution of capitalism. It's not in the cards. And if it were in the cards, it would be too dangerous. So what's left for us to do is to humanize the world, uh, to sugarcoat it. Uh, uh, that's, that's the way in which the idea of revolution is converted into a justification for its opposite. Now come the contemporary social sciences, like economics, which we just briefly discussed, which dispose of the illusions of false necessity only by dismissing the original revolutionary insight. So their overall tendency is to cast a patina of naturalness, of reasonableness, of necessity on the evolution of social life. The normalization of social life. Their spirit is the spirit of right-wing Hegelianism. Of the real is rational. But each social science is, each social science does this in a different way. So we just had the discussion of economics, uh, this quasi-logical, non-causal science, uh, with this particular way of approaching the problem of institution. Each one does it differently, but the overall result is this normalization or rationalization of social life. And the normative political disciplines of legal theory and of the theories of justice in political philosophy also do it in their way. So for example, the theories of justice, like the Rawlsian theory of justice, uh, seem on their face to be very radical, egalitarian. Equality is the maximum objective. But they combine this apparent egalitarianism with an institutional skepticism or conservatism. So what's the pragmatic residue of the sum of the institutional conservatism with the egalitarian profession of faith. The whole theoretical apparatus, even though it seems to be very abstract, in context is just a justification for the homely practices of compensatory redistribution by progressive taxation and redistributive social spending under conservative social democracy institutionally conservative social democracy. And the, the legal counterpart is this rationalizing legal analysis that we're discussing, which then presents the, the flawed accidental compromise that is this eviscerated social democracy, social liberalism, as if it were a system in the language of policies and principles. So then legal thought comes on the scene. 
in the hope of coming to the rescue in some sense and aiding in this operation. Um, restoring our ability to deal with the structure. If we can't deal with it, we have no way of talking about it, of imagining it, we're going to be pushed back to a false criterion of political realism, which is that a proposal is realistic to the extent that it approaches what already exists. And of course, that's not a criterion of realism at all. That's just a declaration of intellectual bankruptcy. It's, real, it's realistic if it's close to what exists. It's not realistic if it's different from what exists. So this is not the place then to, to develop a, a theory of structure. But what I want to do is describe some of the elements of a proto-theory. That stand in the place of this missing idea of structure and structural discontinuity. So the first element is all of the elements of a structure do tend to reinforce each other. But they're not a system. And they don't stand or fall together. So they don't conform to the principle of the indivisibility, which was central to Marx's view of the modes of production. Now, where does the content of these structures come from? It's not as if we were comparing alternatives uh, in the abstract, as if there were some laboratory or cabinet of the institutional alternatives of humanity, and we compare one alternative to all the possible alternatives. No, it's the alternatives that really exist. And one thing that we discover in historical experience is that the same level of functional advantage to produce, to prosper, to make war, to win war, has always alternative institutional foundations. So there isn't a one-to-one -one relation between the functional advantage and the institutional presupposition. There's a loose relation, an institutional presupposition, an institutional indeterminacy or plurality of possible institutional bases. A third feature of these structures is that is the variable force of path dependence the extent to which the past determines the future, shapes the future. We can imagine that a structure is more or less entrenched. We can't say of natural phenomena that they exist uh, more or less, but we can say that of these structures. They're more entrenched, their reality is more objective to the extent that they immunize themselves against challenge and change. But they can also be arranged in such a way that they lay themselves open to revision in the light of experience. And this is what I would call disentrenchment. Now, this feature has a special significance for us, the contemporaries, because in the 19th century, the liberals and socialists did recognize the primacy of regime change, of change in institutions. But each of them had a dogmatic view of what was institutionally necessary. They said, adapt my formula, state control of the economy or the liberal system of rights, and it will make you both free and rich. Uh, we have reason to resist this institutional dogmatism, to affirm, like them, the primacy of structural change, 
over non-structural change, change that influences the primary distribution of advantage and opportunity as opposed to its retrospective correction. But we also have reason to resist the institutional dogmatism. And thus, the special significance of regimes or of institutional arrangements and practices that facilitate their own transformation in the light of experience and that allow us to develop the path along the, along the way. Now, finally, let me cite a fourth element of the view of structure for which we would look. The fourth element is directly relevant to the theory of agency, to the relation between a trajectory of transformation and its social constituency. So, and let me clarify it once again by contrast to the Marxist view. So the Marxist view was that each class has an objective class interest. As class conflict intensifies in vigor and expands in scope, the objective content of the class interest becomes manifest. And the punishment for mistaking what your class interests are is political defeat. Now, in the view for which I would want to argue, it's exactly the opposite. The objectivity or stability of class interest is a mendacious appearance that results from stagnation. The more that conflict escalates in intensity or in scope, the more the question, what are my interests as a member of a certain class or a certain group, becomes inseparable from the question, what are the proximate alternatives? What are the accessible alternatives? And who would I be, my identity? And what would my interests become under each of those alternatives? The question of the content of interests become inseparable from the possibilities. David Hume had said in the 18th century, men fight for their interests, but what their interests are is a matter of opinion. And it's, it's not just here opinion, it's the accessible possibilities, the possibilities in the realm of the adjacent possible. So you can see how this would apply, for example, to the interests of the organized industrial working class headquartered in the capital intensive sectors of the economy. What is their interest? There will always be a way of defining and defending the interest that is institutionally conservative and socially ex exclusive. Our interest is to dig ourselves into our niche in the social division of labor and to defend ourselves, our niche, against the groups closest to us in social and economic space, against the small business class, against the temporary workers, against the foreign workers. But there's always, always another way of understanding and defining the, the group interests, which is institutionally transformative and socially solidaristic. That our interests is to get ourselves out of this mass production industry that has no future and to convert it into a variant of the knowledge economy. But to do that, we have to be able to treat the groups that we used to think of as our rivals as our allies. They have to become our allies in this process of, of engaging the state in the transformation of our niche. And so that shows how as the conflict intensifies, the appearance that the objective content of the interests is 
that the content of the interest is objective or natural disappears. It was just a semblance, an appearance, shaped by the circumstance of relative stagnation. So obviously this way of thinking about structure and structural change is going to turn on the details of the arrangements, which determine then the circumstances of each group. Another example would be the situation of the majority of poor people in the contemporary societies around the world. In China and India and Brazil and Indonesia, they're poor and disorganized. Their horizon of aspiration, rather than being proletarian, is petty bourgeois. What do they want? Characteristically, what they want is to have a little farm, a small shop, a technical service, archaic and isolated family business. That's what they want. But they, that's, that's not the road to progress, either for them or for their countries. So they have to be converted to another view of the possibilities through a set of alliances, of intermediate stages. There has to be an elite, a dissident elite with a productivist and nationalist orientation. That counter elite has to approach this popular majority and convert it from its attachment to isolated and archaic family business to an alternative nationalist productivist project. And that's the stuff of history. Now, in that stuff, everything depends on the details on the institutional details, on the institutional alternatives. The institutional alternatives have to be built with the materials of the existing variations. And where are these details? They're in law. So that's what I wanted to say by way of introducing the theme of structure. That's the introduction to the theme of structure in our, in our conversation. Now we have a few minutes. Would someone like to offer a proposition? So I'm leaving for the future of our conversation two great themes. The theme of agent, the agent of transformation. And the jurist as one of these agents of transformation or related to these agents of transformation. And second, the theme then of the method of legal thought in the performance of this higher vocation, which is transformation of the regime, not of the lesser vocation of deciding cases in courts. Uh, I've offered a view of that. But that's not the real, the most important feature of this view of the lesser vocation is purely negative. It's that it opens a space for something else in the higher vocation and doesn't occupy the whole space with this image of the Herculean judge as a kind of quasi Lycurgus orienting the society really a surrender. That's the argument. Any reflection, any statement? OK. <laughs> I, don't, I, I didn't really expect an immediate uh, uh, <laughs> response, <laughs> but I do hope that you'll, as we go along, you'll offer a different perspective on all of this. This is the real stuff of politics. You know, um, and the problem that we have in, in history is opportunity arises with crisis, right? Up to now, because we haven't created institutions that provide their own opportunities, that disentrench themselves and open themselves. So we have to wait for the comet, uh, for war, for economic collapse. 
And when it comes, the historical agents, the politicians, the statesmen assume that the ideas will appear spontaneously. But Shakespeare said it all in Lear. You can call the spirits, but will they come? So they, the ideas don't appear when you want them to appear. The, repert the repertoire, repertoire of ideas in the world about alternative regimes is very restricted. And, it's, and in, in the crisis or in the moment of opportunity, you need them now. And they don't, and they're not there. So we have these politicians who were radical experimentalists, like Franklin Roosevelt in the United States. And then the moment comes of the early institutional experimental, and they're at the mercy of the dominant ideas of their time. At that time, they were corporatist ideas. So the ideas that Roosevelt deployed in the year and a half of radical institutional experimentalism were very similar to the economic ideas of the Hitler regime in its beginning. Now, the Americans don't want to hear that, but that's the simple truth, because people are at the mercy of the ideas that are available to them. Did what? Is law just politics in the story? No, law is not just politics, whatever that means. I think the... Versus assumed by. So uh, politics, of course, in this, in this story, there's routine politics and there's higher politics. Higher politics is about regime change mm -hmm. or regime defense. Huh? Uh, and then visions of law should be a part of that, an essential part of that. Because if we think that history doesn't have a project for us, the Marxist assumption, we have to have our project. Where, where do the institutional ideas come from? Uh, and those ideas, if, if the so what is law? I say this in one of these meetings I was on. So our, our ideals and our interests are always nailed to the cross of the institutions and practices that represent them in fact. Law is the site of this crucifixion. Uh, and so if we want to change things, we have to engage with the institutional details. And where are the institutional details and alternatives represented at the level of requisite detail in law? And that seems to me the greatest evil that this rationalizing legal analysis has done because it's, it's pushed all of this detail of possible transformation and hidden it under this abstractions that they make that's a system that will humanize it. Uh, so that's intimately related to this mission of the progressives in the contemporary world to become the humanizers of the inevitable. You ask them, what's their program? Their program is the program of their conservative adversaries with a humanizing discount. And how were they brought to this? By lack of imagination. All right. On that somber note, <laughs> we, we readjourn until next week. Yeah, I'll give you one. No problem. Thank you. Good, thank you.